everyone and welcome to the 12th Canadian Science Policy Conference CSPC 2020 interview series. As you know, this year's conference is virtual format and we are conducting the interview virtual. My name is Homa Kherulapur, co-chair of CSPC committee, and I'm joined today by three members of Ryerson Urban Water Group, Dr. Kim Gilbrat, professor of chemistry and biology, Kim, if you can wave so we know. Oh, actually, we have your name. Great. <laughs> we have Dr. Rania Hamze, assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering, and Dr. Patricia Hania, assistant professor in the Department of Law and Business at the Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University. Thank you all for joining the, uh, and putting the time today for this interview and tell us about your project on contaminants of emerging concern and the gap between science and policy. So let me start the question um, with you, Dr. Gilbright. So can you tell us about your research and the project? Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. And we are quite excited today to uh, be here to talk about our contaminants of emerging concern in wastewater, um, or CECs, as we say in short. Now, what exactly are CECs? A lot of people ask us. And these are basically just compounds that are recent, have been recently defined as either of a concern or maybe a potential risk uh, that, that are really not monitored or measured in wastewater at the moment. So since many of these products are used daily, so for instance, uh, in the household, uh, shampoos, detergents, uh, soaps, and then in industries, uh, you know, solvents, and in, you know, even in uh, hospitals, pharmaceuticals, antibiotics, all of these things that we use eventually end up um, down the sink and in the wastewater. So for this reason, uh, wastewater treatment plants because they're not really designed to remove these compounds, are really considered one of the main sources of CECs in the environment. So, however, you know, our understanding of the risks imposed by these compounds to humans and to the ecosystem is really actually not well known at the moment. And furthermore, there is quite a large legislation gap regarding the regulation of CEC effluent from wastewater treatment plants. And now this gap it really cannot be filled without getting a really comprehensive list of a classification system and list of those compounds, along with all the analytical detection methods we might need and the monitoring methods, and finally like the risk assessment protocols. And so this is basically why the three of us got together. You know, we are aware of each other because, as you mentioned, we're part of the Ryerson Urban Water Group. And this group is a really multidisciplinary group focused around water issues and specifically really uh, concerned with the urban water cycle. So therefore, when uh, SHRC, along with uh, CIHR and NSERC, launched this new uh, synthesis, uh, knowledge synthesis gap competition, uh, late last year under living within the earth's carrying capacity. Uh, Rania, Dr. Hamza came and said to me, this looks like something we could apply for. And we immediately thought about Patricia, Dr. Hania, uh, to create, the three of us create a really multidisciplinary team to look at these contaminants of emerging concern. And I think it's really natural the three of us came together to tackle this subject because Rania is a civil engineer. Uh, Patricia is a policy and law professor and myself, I'm a, an environmental microbiologist, and I've been looking at wastewater for quite a few years. And we realized that if we all got together, we could identify these gaps in knowledge and uh, bring together not just the chemistry and the analytical methods to detect them, but also to look how society deals with these compounds through legislation. So we went ahead, we went and applied, and we got a one-year grant uh, to determine if uh, the current analytical technologies and the current policy development and industry guidelines for CCs were really enough to protect human and eco ecological health. And we went ahead and formed a team. It comprises not just ourselves, but several graduate students, undergraduate students, and they're from science, engineering, and uh, policy to help identify the current knowledge and to identify the significant gaps in the classification of these compounds, along with the monitoring detection systems, and along with the risks posed by uh, the CCs in the wastewater. Now, what do we found? We found that there's probably well over 600 CCs, <laughs> and most of them have little or no information about their effects on the environment, 
or any p- potential synergistic effects between them when they get you know, when they're combined. So we've decided after all of that to uh, specifically concentrate on a few of those groups, including the pharmaceuticals uh, with specific emphasis on antibiotics, uh, fire retardants and PFAS and microplastics. And our goal with this project is really to clarify the, uh, the extent and the impact of the knowledge gap around CDCs and their synergistic effects in wastewater. And we hope the results of our investigation will inform all levels of government, industry, and public about the potential effects and impacts of CDCs on human and ecological health. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, for your very comprehensive explanation. So now I would like to ask you, Dr. Hamze, can you please describe some of these contaminants that Kim mentioned uh, that present in water waste treatment plant technologies and create a problem for wastewater treatment plants engineers? Um, Thank you for the question. And yeah, sure. Uh, The problem is actually at the wastewater treatment level, The problem lies is that we don't know enough about these contaminants. There is a growing list of unregulated compounds or pollutants that we collectively call them uh, contaminant of emerging concern or CECs. And that's basically for the lack of a better name to label a huge list of contaminants. These CECs, as the name indicates, are emerging and they are actually keep evolving as our daily activities and consumption pattern change. Uh, They are of concern because they are not effectively removed during the wastewater treatment processes and they end up in our receiving surface water uh, through the wastewater treatment discharge. It's worth to note that actually these surface water are used as drinking water sources and that means that we're actually might be contaminating the drinking water. In fact, some studies uh, showed that CECs were detected in drinking water in various regions around the world. And as an example, we have seen pharmaceuticals, prescription and non-prescription drugs, personal care products. And what's really interesting about these contaminants as, is that although they are like everywhere in the aquatic environments, they are actually, it's generally accepted that the main source of CECs is municipal wastewater uh, treatment plan discharges. We want to talk about uh, what we focused on in this project is microplastic fibers. So they are predominantly, predominantly occurring in, my, in wastewater treatment plant and they come from washing machines. So each time we wash our polyester shirt or stretchy jeans, uh, thousands of fibers are actually shed and released into the wastewater. The challenge is that how do we design wastewater treatment plant to remove these microplastics and other byproducts uh, that are heavily modified and tensicides? They do pollute the water sources and stress the capacity of the earth for sure. Uh, what most municipalities and policymakers don't really recognize is that CECs and microplastic, mass, microplastic fibers are not well removed in the treatment processes in the wastewater treatment plant. And the reason for that is that wastewater treatment plants were never designed to remove these contaminants. As I said, they are emerging and we don't really know how, they, like how many they are. Dr. Gerbleit uh, just mentioned that when we were doing our search, we can, like we found that we have over 600 compounds and there might be more. So, Wastewater treatment plants were never designed to remove them, and thus they end up in the aquatic environment. Uh, Many of these CECs were found to be endocrine disruptors, and they are very small in, um, like microplastic fibers, for example, are very small in size when they are ingested by marine animals um, and aquatic like um, organisms. Uh, They are indirectly introduced to the food chain and can potentially cause human uh, health issues. Uh, microplastic were also found to be vector to many other contaminants of emerging concern and their synergetic effects, long-term risk and other um, risk factors uh, with, their, with the exposure of these compounds uh, is not yet established in the scientific um, like knowledge and we, we still don't know about the risk or the long-term impact. Wow. Um- let, let me ask Dr. Hamza, but with all this explanation that you have, like, what happens in our wastewater treatment plants and, and why are these contaminants are not removed? 
Uh, so, well, actually, the moment we flush toilets, drain sinks, or washing machines, wastewater starts its journey. So wastewater um, is transported via what we call sewage uh, pipes or sewers, uh, and they transport it to the wastewater treatment uh, plants and where we have different processes that take place to clean the water. Among these processes, we have the main uh, process, which is the biological treatment, and that takes care of biodegrading the organic matter that we have in the wastewater. Biological processes, as the name indicates, rely on microorganisms to remove the organics by simply eating them, growing, and then the water is cleansed after we separate these microorganisms, which we call sludge now, from the treated affluent. But this is not the case for CECs. These CECs are resistant to biodegradation and they end up in the wastewater effluents, which are discharged, as I mentioned, into the surface water bodies like creeks or rivers. These surface water are also a source of drinking water. So what's even worse is that the functional microorganisms that we, re we rely on to remove the conventional contaminants and the organics and some of the nutrients, these CECs are actually, uh, these, these microorganisms are very sensitive to toxic chemicals uh, and they can be easily upset when they are subjected to the CECs that we discharge. In fact, recent studies in the lab experiment found that the treatment performance was inhibited or negatively affected by the introduction of uh, CECs, microplastic fibers, and other toxic compounds that uh, we, we have found. And um, the rate at which we're introducing this pollutant is becoming beyond the Earth's capacity to assimilate. And for myself as a civil engineer, my research focuses on developing new technologies and advanced processes to enhance the treatment performance and target the CECs. And this is where we think innovation comes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hamza. So let me ask you, Patricia, Dr. Ayahania, about the policy aspect of it. So can, can you tell us how do you regulate something unknown to the uh, wastewater treatment plant operator? Is this gap between science and law or policy? Well, yes, there is. I absolutely. And what I would say from a law and policy perspective is that we need to look at the precautionary principle and adaptive management perspective because they can provide some assistance. However, in a practical standpoint, really, how does this law and policy principle approach help an operator at a wastewater treatment plant? That's the million dollar question. And we hope in our research, when we do our um, interviews at the water treatment plant that operators will give us insight into this question for sure. But what I really think you're asking me is, how do you regulate uncertainty? How do you regulate this gap? How do you design a legal regulatory regime that is responsive to emerging contaminants and can protect human health and ecological health. When the science is emerging on CSCs and knowledge gaps exist for engineers, for policymakers, and so therefore how, do, how does an operator really treat the a specific um, CSC at a wastewater treatment plant? I think innovative technology and a resilient legal system that is protective of human health and ecological health is key. So in a nutshell, yes, we know that there is a regulatory gap on CSCs in regards to wastewater treatment plants. But from a law and policy perspective, the root of this regulatory gap, it really falls at the feet of law. That is the gap stems from our fragmented jurisdictional framework of the Canadian Constitution. Because under the Canadian Constitution, all three levels, federal, provincial, and municipal, have a role to play on this issue. And so, for example, when we look at CSCs, we have numerous environmental regulations that we touch on. For instance, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, the Fisheries Act, the Pest Control Products Act, the Canada Water Act, all of these. And at a provincial level, we may also touch on the Ontario Environmental Protection Act. And other CECs may be regulated indirectly, perhaps through an environmental assessment. And then when we look at, for instance, pharmaceuticals, they may not fall under any of these environmental 
um, pieces of legislation. Instead, they may uh, fall under regulation that um, regulates food and drug. So therefore, you've got this complicated regulatory regime in play. And when it comes to wastewater treatment plants themselves, we're looking at, yes, there may be wastewater regulations directly or indirectly directly or indirectly in place. For instance, under the Federal um, Fisheries Act, we know that there's legislation in place that we cannot um, discharge any deleterious substance into a waterway. So there, because we need to protect the fish. But we also have wastewater it's called the wastewater systems effluent regulation, which requires municipalities then to monitor the wastewater that comes in and that's discharged, right? So we have all these different levels, but none of these pieces of legislation that I've just referenced deal with CECs specifically. So that was why we all came together and started thinking about this, because not only is it complicated by this legislative regime, but most of the work has been done around drinking water. Research has not really focused on wastewater treatment plants when, as you've already heard from my colleagues, it's one of the main sources. So why are we not looking at this? So in this research, we will examine the regulatory regimes directly or indirectly that affect these. And we'll look at those some 600, but really look, um, focus on the three areas that uh, Dr. Gilbride had discussed and really hoping to create a legal regime that's responsive to the earth's carrying capacity where we can consider the protection of ecological and human health. Thank you, Dr. Henia. Maybe I ask you, um, what do you think about the role of organizations like CSBC of playing a role to help fill these gaps that you mentioned between science and policy and then dealing with uh, issues like contaminants of emerging concern? Well, for me, who is um, a social legal but really calls herself a, a social ecological um, researcher because I'm interested in how all of these different disciplines come together. It's key. This is, uh, the CSPC is an organization that allows for knowledge translation, allows for uh, science to inform law and policy. I wouldn't be able to understand how to draft a law without having a conversation with all the brilliant scientists around me. And so, and I consistently say this, I think it's one lesson that we've even learned on our team is how much we've learned from each other. And that is definitely where the CSPC is a key. And I would say the challenges that we face in the future around water, we have to have these conversations together and be open and learning from each other. So the CSPC is key to that knowledge translation and exchange. That's great to hear, actually. And then as a final question, is there any closing notes and, uh, to add, or is there something that, um, or somewhere online that our viewers can read more about your great work? Maybe well, Kim, do you want, or Patricia? I, I, that great work, but I'm going to pass that to Dr. Gilbright. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Yeah, so thanks. So yes, we invite everybody to follow us on the uh, Ryerson Urban Water website. And uh, our, definitely our knowledge synthesis gap report will appear there uh, probably in the spring of 2021 once we finish uh, gathering all this information and synthesizing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. It was really great talking to you. I really enjoyed our conversation and I hope you enjoyed the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You.